Autism is a spectrum of disorders that can affect behavior, social interaction, and communication. The definition and medical criteria for autism spectrum disorder have changed in recent years, but efforts for early detection and treatment are growing. As part of TVO special programming for World Autism Awareness Day, we're looking beyond the spectrum with tonight's guests. And with that, we welcome, in Seattle, Washington, Dr. Brian King. He's director of Seattle Children's Autism Center. And with us back here in studio, Catherine Bucket, education writer and coordinator at Autism Ontario. Nadia Hamilton, whose brother has autism. She's also co-founder of Magnus Mode, which creates apps for people with autism spectrum disorders. Peter Zatmary, who is chief of the Child and Youth Mental Health Collaborative, and Jennifer Kustra, mother of an autistic teen. And we are happy, Dr. King, to welcome you to our broadcast from out of town and to our four guests around the table. Nice to have you back, Peter. You were here a long time ago. It's good to see you back here again as well. Let me read a couple of things, mm -hmm. uh, share numbers with you that I'm sure you all know, just to get our audience up to speed on what we're talking about here tonight. Uh, autism spectrum disorder by the numbers we're calling this. About one in 68 children has been identified with autism spectrum disorder. ASD is reported to occur in all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. And ASD affects more than 1% of the population. Boys with ASD outnumber girls by as much as four to one. And more than 80% of children with ASD show clear behavioral signs by the age of two. And as we suggested in the introduction, the numbers in the last five years, according to the Centers for Disease Control, have increased by huge amounts. So we want to try to explore this a little further. Uh, Dr. King, get us started here. We would like to know when you first either personally or professionally became associated with <coughs> autism spectrum disorder. So that happened in the early 1980s for me. So I've been uh, in the field for 25 or so years. Um, and, uh, and when I entered, the disorder was much rarer. It was regarded as being uh, very rare indeed compared to the numbers that you've just uh, shared. Did a personal connection bring you to it? No, you know, I was just completely taken by the uh, behaviors that I was seeing in the children who at that time were actually institutionalized in a facility that we happened to be touring as part of our um, psychiatry training. Okay, Dr. Zatmary, how about you? So <clears throat> Brian and I are of the same generation. I started uh, in, uh, I'll never forget, uh, I can even remember the day, 1981, I was, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I was seeing a particular kid and uh, no, uh, nobody had been able to figure out what diagnosis this particular kid had. Uh, and then it dawned on me, well, maybe this is what high functioning autism or Asperger's syndrome looks like. And that actually seemed to make a difference to the kid and the family. And then that got me going on this journey. Again, though, no personal, anybody in the family, nothing like that. Yeah, well, no, there's nobody in the family. Gotcha. Catherine Bucket, how about you? I fell into autism um, about 15 years ago, working for a family um, who had started a home-based ABA program. Their ABA? Little, ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis Program. Their little boy had been recently diagnosed, and so they'd pulled together all their money and put together a team and got together a psychologist to oversee everything, and that was my first introduction into autism. And now you're with the association. Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay, I've left you two for the end for obvious reasons, <laughs> because this is not a professional thing for you two. Uh, okay, Jennifer, how about you? So my son is 17 years old, so I've been dealing with it for 17 years, but he was diagnosed, um, well, flags were raised when he was in nursery school by his nursery school teacher, again in kindergarten, uh, between grade one and two, he was diagnosed with another um, learning disorder, and then in grade four, he was, he was identified as having Asperger's syndrome, or ASD. Grade four, so he's 10-ish at that yeah, point? Yeah, And, well, I guess we'll get into the struggle it's been ever since then. Mm -hmm, but it, absolutely. Has, has it been the central focus of your life ever absolutely. since? Absolutely. It's why I'm here on the face of the earth. Is I know what my meaning in life is. It is to raise my son to be as successful as he can possibly be. Gotcha. Nettie, how about you? Yeah, I think it's interesting how knowing somebody with autism sets us on a new path. Yeah. My younger brother has autism, and I think from the time he was six years old, we were in our living room and we were playing and we noticed that he was a little different. 
And uh, then he got diagnosed around the age of six. And since then, for let's say 23 odd more years, uh, I've been living with autism, mm -hmm. and I decided to start a social enterprise enterprise to help others with autism like him. Hmm. And is it, as it is for Jennifer now, the central focus of your life? Oh, for sure. Not now. Always. always. From the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. So once you have somebody in the family who's got autism, it tends to just take over everything. Definitely. Mm -hmm. You Absolutely. find that, Jennifer? Absolutely. It's your whole world. You have to learn how to communicate differently. You have to learn to make their world as comfortable as possible as you can for them um, while still giving them encouragement to grow and learn. Um, so we've made modifications sort of in our schedule, our food schedules, um, how we talk to him, how we transition him to make him more comfortable in, in his day-to-day -day life. Gotcha. Uh, Brian King, come on in here and tell us about, because you pointed out off the top that it was a fairly rare phenomenon when you first got associated with mm -hmm. autism. Uh, tell us about how our understanding of what it was back in the 80s when you first became associated with it and what it is today, how that's changed. Well, that's, a, that's actually a really great question. I'm not sure that our understanding about what it is has actually advanced all that terribly much. Mm -hmm. We have become much more humble about um, uh, appreciating how much we don't know, I think. Um, you know, the numbers that I alluded to the fact that the numbers were very different or seemed very different back then. Um, the, the prevalence back in the 1980s was um, about 3,000% lower than what it is now, you know, just this last week with the CDC numbers. And one of the things to, to highlight, um, in addition to a growing appreciation of, of how there actually is not one autism, but rather that, uh, that we might or should be thinking about the autisms um, that include quite a broad spectrum of, uh, of ability and disability. One of the things, things to highlight is that as the numbers have grown, um, many people have, um, I think, attempted to minimize the significance of that by highlighting the fact that the growth or much of the growth has occurred at the higher end of the spectrum, uh, which although that's true, I think um, what we've already established today in terms of the impact that autism has on an individual and a family is enormous. and and. Every one of the people that has been identified through the efforts of the, the CDC and uh, in the service of its studies is significantly impacted by autism. Peter, pick up the story from there insofar as we have two examples here of family members who got diagnosed, it seems, relatively late in the game. Mm -hmm. Are we any better today at diagnosing autism spectrum disorders mm -hmm. by the age of two? Uh, we are a lot better. Now actually six is pretty good compared to the way it was when Brian and I started where the average age of diagnosis would be much later, particularly for the higher functioning kids. So uh, I think we're better at bringing the diagnosis down. The average age of diagnosis in Canada, for example, is about three and a half to four years of age. And that's pretty good? That's pretty good. Uh, there's been a whole generation of what are called baby SIP studies that have taught us that actually autism begins to emerge probably after six months. Uh, most cases would have emerged by 12 months of age. Parents on average become first concerned at about 18 months of age. So there's no reason why we can't bring it down from three and a half to 18 months of age. So we still have a ways to go. And I think that's gonna be possible in the, the next uh, five uh, or years or so. What's that breakthrough that will permit you to go from three years of age to 18 months? Well, we need better measurement tools. We need better screening tools. The screening tools that we currently have are just missing too many kids at that early stage. So we just have to have a better surveillance Family doctors have to be better at it. General primary care pediatricians have to be better at picking up these signs so that they're not missed or put aside or explained for some other reason. And Catherine, again, following up on that, what are the signs at an early age that people ought to be looking for that suggest we may have a case of ASD here? 
Um, one of the biggest signs is joint attention. So sometimes you can be holding your child and take a look up and notice something in the sky and maybe your baby isn't they taking a look and noticing that too. Um, a lot of families report that they're, you know, in the process realize that there were things that were different about their baby. Um, and I think like Dr. Satsmari said, uh, it's important to follow up with your doctor and we see across the province and here across the province stories about doctors not necessarily following up right away. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, when did you begin to notice something was amiss with your son? Well, I think I was aware there was something different about my child before I could acknowledge that to myself. Um, when you talk about joint attention, how long it took him to laugh. We were talking before the show about, you know, I'm a type A personality, so I was documenting every little thing my child did as an infant. And then when we get to be about five months, we, I start realizing he's not hitting milestones. So my book sort of starts going away and I start, stop you know documenting that and you start thinking oh well it's okay but then you get to nursery school and you have a stranger tell you that or not a stranger but a nursery school teacher tell you um, your child is always going to be thought of as eccentric by his peers right so alarm bells go off uh, then I think I was able to start understanding that my child was different um, but retrospectively as young as an infant. So I have a four and a half month old niece now who my sister is terrified might get ASD. But holding her, I can tell you that she's completely different and she doesn't have ASD. She's just nothing all like my son, right? How do you know? She looks me in the eye, she has joint attention, I can make her laugh, she likes to giggle about stuff. Hmm. She reacts in a, a way that you would expect, right? And why'd you put the book aside? When you, were, when you were keeping a log of things, you stopped doing well, it. Well, because I think at that point in time, I was, it was all about I'm, I'm a high achiever and my child was going to be high achiever and I was going to document all his high achievements and then mm -hmm. when he starts missing milestones, you start going, oh, that's a little scary and I don't really want to think about that, right? Um, but to the point about the pediatrician and the measuring tools, I took my son to the, to the pediatrician when he was uh, late kindergarten, early grade one, and was told by my pediatrician there was nothing wrong, even though I had several things that I was pointing to to go, these things are different about my child, I think there's something going on. She basically told me it was me, right? What did you see in your brother that you thought was different and therefore well, might be... There was a lot of signs, um, like Jennifer was saying, and um, for example, lack of eye contact. Mm -hmm. He would also walk right over us. If we were sitting on the floor, he'd walk yeah. right over my mom, much to her heartbreak. Mm -hmm. um, he, was, he had several challenges um, in development, so walking and, and learning to talk and laugh. And, and also, he was very sensitive to sound. Yeah. So at the slightest sound, he would cover his ears mm -hmm. and just run, flee the room. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it was Mariah Carey, and we're like, okay, well, maybe he just doesn't like the high <laughs> singing. <laughs> but other times it was just, uh, we would not hear anything, and we became aware that it was actually white noise that was upsetting him. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And also, he would only eat five to seven foods max. Yes. Uh, what does that mean? So very, very picky eater. So for example, if uh, he's <laughs> going to eat rice, it has to be done a certain way. If he's going to eat chicken, it's got to be done a certain way. Mm -hmm. And we could count on our fingers the amount of foods that he would eat. Mm -hmm. hmm. I, I want to make sure I get the language right here, but is it high functioning and low functioning? Is that the, the language that's used? That's generally used, yes. Okay. And what is he? He's smack dab in the middle. So he has, while he has lots of abilities, um, he also has a lot of challenges. So he's nonverbal. Um, he needs help to advocate for his needs. But at the same time, he's a brilliant mathematician. He's brilliant in building things. And he's sensitive and empathetic in ways that I've, people that I've met can't even uh, understand. And Jennifer, your son? My son is formal diagnosis is Asperger's syndrome. So he's high functioning. High functioning, verbal, mm -hmm. obviously. Oh, very verbal, yeah. very intelligent, you know, very, very skilled. Um, Hi, IQ. Okay, on the issue of Asperger's, uh, let me go back to Brian King in Seattle then for a second, because um, I mm -hmm. gather you had a role in removing Asperger's syndrome from the new DSM, which is, you know, as many people know, the Bible of, of uh, the statistical manual of mental disorders, I guess, the DSM-5. Uh, can you confirm that, mm -hmm. first of all? Did you have a role in that? Yes, my fingerprints are on that Bible. Okay, I, I did have a role. I was part. I was part of the uh, part of the work group that was responsible for taking a look at the definition of autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders, and uh, incorporating 
what we've learned in the 17 years since the previous definition was uh, introduced. And why was it time for Asperger's to go? Well, um, before we, before I talk about the reason to go, I wonder if I could just insert how valuable it was for it to be inserted in the first place. Sure. Um, that, that when Asperger's disorder was uh, initially introduced, and um, I believe that Dr. Zatmari had uh, a hand in that, um, it created an opportunity for the field to better uh, sort uh, individuals with different abilities in the search of uh, potential and unique genetic genetic causes for uh, different manifestations of autism and so on. And uh, so it set the stage for us then to look and see if Asperger's disorder uh, seemed to behave genetically in some way that was unique and different from autism or from pervasive developmental disorder uh, not otherwise specified, which was another category that used to exist. And as we've looked uh, over the years at those genetic studies in a number of different ways, either looking within the same family and asking if one family member has Asperger's disorder, will a second family member also have that same disorder if, if there's another person affected? Um, and it turns out that that's, that's not the case. A second family member is just as likely to have autism or PDD NOS. Whether the severity of uh, autism spectrum disorders is shared within families or whether um, even within commonly shared genetic conditions, for example, Fragile X, whether if an individual is going to have an autism spectrum disorder, it's always the same. What we've found over time, in fact, is that the same person will literally migrate from autism into pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified sometimes, as their symptoms have changed. And so having those, those categories was very helpful in moving the field forward. And it really laid the, uh, the foundation for us to come to recognize that, um, that these disorders can be expressed across a wide variety of severity. And that will help us as we now move forward to identify the genetic and other causes of autism spectrum disorders. Okay, Peter, pick up the story and tell us why you think it's important. Why, why would it be significant that Asperger's syndrome is no longer in the Bible, in the DSM? Um, I think because it, um, uh, it added a level of complexity that was more, did more harm than good, I think. So families would spend a lot of time, for example, on a diagnostic odyssey trying to understand whether their child had autism or Asperger's syndrome. And that would delay them getting into interventions, whereas in fact the interventions weren't really driven by the diagnostic label, but actually were driven by their cognitive skills, their language skills, their communication skills. So I think what DSM-5 has done is sort of simplified the situation so that you've just got ASD and that's it. Let's not worry about what subtype or what a category it might be. So I think that's been a move in the right direction. Well, let me find out from Jennifer. Your, your son has Asperger's. Yes. Is the fact that Asperger's is no longer in the DSM, has that affected yours no. and his life at all? No, because he still qualifies under the diagnosis of ASD. So he still hits the criteria of, of having ASD. So whether you put that ASD label or the Asperger's label is inconsequential. Like, like Peter was saying, it's about access to services. As long as we continue to gain access to reasonable services, that's what, what that's all about. Okay. There are yeah. some jurisdictions. I was Steve, just going to follow I, up on that. Yeah. If yeah. I can just make the point, mm -hmm. where uh, they put, they impose arbitrary limitations on access, mm -hmm. and they would say, for example, that somebody like Asperger would not get uh, access to those services. Right. Mm -hmm. Actually, now removing it and saying everybody's got ASD allows those folks to get access mm -hmm. to those services, which mm -hmm. I think has been a benefit. Okay. Should we talk Magnus mm -hmm. cards? Sure. I bet you'd like to. Let's watch <laughs> this. To. Let's watch this video first, shall okay. we? Okay. Watch the monitors here in the studios. Roll tape, please. Magnus Cards provides step-by-step -step instruction on how to complete tasks. Tasks that would normally be roadblocks to independence. On each Magnus Card, you can add text or photos in order to explain how to do an activity. 
So for example, if you want to learn how to recycle, then you would take a picture of the blue bin, what goes in the blue bin, what goes in the green bin, what goes in the black bin, in order to understand the process of recycling. This would be so helpful for somebody with autism. For my son's future, I want him to be happy. I want him to have as much independence as he can possibly have. And I think for most parents with autism, that's their goal. Where'd you come up with this idea? Um, in our living room, growing up with my brother. Uh, we used to play a lot of video games together. And every single game that we played, no matter how many times we played it, he wanted to refer to the official strategy guide. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's like a detailed walkthrough of a stage. So then I started noticing he wanted to do the same thing with recipes when cooking with my mom. And then working as an ABA, Applied Behavior Therapist, with other people with autism, I began to notice the same trend. Um, I think that it's because it affords them the structure, the structure that they mm -hmm. need to fall back on to be able to act independently with freedom. Um, How so long has the app been out there? It's been out there about a month and a half, actually, live. Um, but in continuing with the story. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, Forgive me, Nadia. Didn't mean to rush you along I'm there. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, anyway, we, we grew up playing these games, and then uh, I graduated from university. I worked in the field uh, with other families affected by autism. And one day, my brother graduated from high school, and I said, you know, there's really a lack of support out there for teens mm. and young adults with autism, and he's my brother. I love him to death. Why don't I do something? Why don't I create? the ultimate strategy guide <laughs> for life. So any situation you can think of, let's, let's create guides that walk them through, that they can go back on, that provides them that structure in real life, enabling them to function in society independently. Your organization supports this? Absolutely. How do you know it works? Huge. We're we still did a trial. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to talk about that, actually? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Apparently, I interrupt this story again. Yeah, okay, well, go ahead. We did a trial with Autism Ontario York Region uh, last summer, uh, July to uh, September uh, 2012, uh, 2013, my, my mistake. And uh, basically, we went in there, we, we, we used Magnus cards with their participants, and uh, we tested to see who would, we, would be successful with across the spectrum. There's a huge spectrum, obviously. Mm -hmm. So we discovered through our study that people that were mid to high functioning were more capable of using it independently, and people that were low to mid functioning were more capable of using it with a little bit of support. So this character named Magnus, who is behind Magnus Cards and behind Magnus Mode, the company, is that support. He guides the user through the program. He's a friend, he's a tutor, he's a guide. Where'd you get the name from? I, I just like the name. You it means like great. It. <laughs> okay, right. It means great, Magnus, and then Mode is a way of doing things. Great gotcha. way of doing things. Okay, anything else? Nope, go okay. ahead. Okay, <laughs> I don't want to interrupt again. If this is part of the good news of the story, I want to talk to you about some of the other side of the story. Because I've heard you, I've read that you have described our autism support system in Ontario like Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. What does that refer to? Well, I think that um, my journey's been a 17-year journey, and I think that we continue to improve. But I th when you get a diagnosis of autism, of, of any functioning, it's a, a terrifying event in your life as a parent and as a person um, because you just want so much for your child, and now you're sort of concerned about what that outcome's going to be. And the great thing about autism is that it's a spectrum and so uh, you know depends on where you land on that spectrum what your outcomes are but I always look at it that you can you can sort of walk through that spectrum and, and move that along and I can't remember what you asked me I'm sorry I just <laughs> wonder you you made the quote about it being like a Swiss oh, cheese yeah. so Pizza. so when you when you get this diagnosis then it's very hard to know where to go right so I had a pediatrician who was a great pediatrician well respected in my community told me it was all in my head right um, my first diagnosis was of nonverbal learning disorder, not of, of Asperger's syndrome, right? You know, then you, you continue to struggle to get a diagnosis that fits, and it's ASD. And then you, you, uh, you in your own mind, go, well, what's the difference between ASD and, and, uh, and Asperger's? And what's the difference between Asperger's and NLD? And you spend, like Peter said, all that time mm -hmm. trying to understand what the diagnosis is and what it relates to and, instead of getting services. And then when you go to get services, there's no real single source of information 
information. There's no sort of pathway to follow. There's no, okay, you have diabetes, and so these are the steps you need to take. Because everybody's on the spectrum, I suppose, is, is an influence on it, but you have to navigate the system by yourself as a parent. You've got to do all your own research. You've got to figure out the good from the bad. What are Scary and complicated, absolutely. It is very complicated. Um, one thing that I will notice that's very different from when Troy was diagnosed is that there's a vibrant online community now yes. of parents yes. who are coming yeah. together to help other parents. The other day I went into a parent support group through Magnus Mode and I posted, I said, you know, my brother only eats off of white plates. Anybody ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. And then a parent actually reached out to me and she said, my son only re eats off of black plates. <laughs> so it's about the sharing and this understanding. It's about, it's about saying, you know, we're all different our kids are different but it's okay mm -hmm. and here's what I did to get to where I am here's what you can do here's some advice let's share tips let's work together mm -hmm. I uh, want to raise something rather uh, stark right now and we've seen lots of stories in the press over the last many many years about how kids bully each other at school but bullying in the case of autism has got to be just I mean omnipresent and a real challenge all the time a uh, couple of weeks ago, I've got a note here, a couple of weeks ago, story out of Maryland in the States, two teenage girls charged with assault after they convinced a 16-year-old autistic boy to, among other things, walk on a frozen lake where the ice was too thin to hold him. And yet the boy continued to think of these girls as his friends. Catherine, what do you hear on bullying kids who've got autism? Over the summer, Jonathan Weiss, who is the ASD chair at York University, presented his research study that he's done in partnership um, with Catherine Cappadocia and I'm bl blanking on her name, Deborah Pepperell? Um, okay. Pepler, thank you. And uh, talked about how uh, children with ASD are more likely to be bullied. They were finding in their research study that they're more likely to be bullied uh, compared to children in the regular population. Um, and that 77% of the parents that he'd surveyed said that their child had been bullied. 54% of them said that it was pervasive and going on throughout the year. So that they were finding that these parents were reporting these experiences. This was a common occurrence that was happening in school. Kids can be adorable, but kids can be cruel. So, uh, Brian King, why don't you come in here at this point and tell us, what do you think? All parents worry about their kids being bullied. I can only imagine if you're the parent of an autistic child, how much more you would worry. What can they do? Mm -hmm. um, well, just to um, add to the, uh, the data that you heard, there uh, has been another study here in the States uh, using the interactive autism network, it's thousands of families that uh, respond to questions that are put out to the group, and uh, fully 70% of them endorsed um, their child having been bullied at some time, with about 50%, 40 to 50%, uh, even within the past month. Um, so it, it is a pervasive problem, and um, and it. Uh, there are many, all, all too many, very sad stories like the one that you highlighted. Um, you know, most people who, and th there are resources that families can go to um, and that talk at length about this. The Autism Speaks website is a, is a great one that has a number of uh, tips for how to manage it. But the first and foremost is uh, making it, becoming very aware of it and uh, um, being sensitive to potential changes that one's child may exhibit um, that might indicate that something has gone amiss at school. Jennifer, what'd you do? Uh, so, for example, it, oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah, let, 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 stand by one second, Dr. King, because I. I presume your son sure. experienced this kind of thing? Absolutely. What did you do about it? We uh, decided when he was in grade six uh, that we had had enough of the public school system's inability to address and keep him safe. Hmm. And we went into the private uh, school sector, thank goodness for grandmothers, because we couldn't have done that without them. Um, but Is we that went a reference to financial? Financial, yeah. Absolutely. A lot of money? Well, it's over $120,000 so far, and he's in grade 12. So my mortgage, etc. So the financial burden is enormous to keep your child safe. Um, uh, what we thought we needed to do to keep our child safe. Um, he is now in an environment that has zero tolerance and an appropriate zero tolerance and they, they, they are a small school um, and it's not just a school for people with ASD. It's a, 
a school for people with learning differences. Uh, so you have those that have uh, more or less social skills uh, in the environment. Um, and they have kept him safe and have preserved his, uh, his self-worth and his self-esteem and his dignity. So money well spent. Money well spent. Catherine, you wanted to add? And I'm just going to jump back in just in terms of local Ontario resources. Autism Ontario hosted this webinar this summer with Jonathan Weiss, and it has strategies and tips on how to protect and prevent bullying, mm -hmm. um, and then also as a team to address it. So teachers, parents, um, other staff, or other uh, classmates as well, to keep people safe, to keep people with autism safe in the school system. The other thing that I am going to mention is that there was additional work done by Jonathan Weiss that exists on his ASD mental health blog for anybody that is interested in looking for that information and if you want to access our webinar all you have to do is visit our Autism Ontario website it's an hour and it's chock full of really helpful interesting data and really helpful strategies and information. Peter. I'll just add that I think it's important to look at this in a developmental context so we're doing a longitudinal study of kids from the point of uh, diagnosis at two to three years of age and then following them uh, over time and what we find is that those kids who are integrated in a regular classroom right from the very beginning develop friendships in uh, kindergarten grade one uh, maybe not reciprocal friendships but other kids start looking after them and those sort of special relationships often tend to last so the bullying isn't necessarily in the early years of school it's when they move to a new school like junior high school or High, a senior high school and a whole new cohort of kids come into that school they're not familiar with a kid with ASD and that's really when the bullying starts and there isn't the support. Why aren't we doing a better job in our school system of dealing with this? The schools have to under have to have a no bullying policy, a but zero they tolerance. They all do. They yeah, all but, say they do. Mm -hmm. But there are ways of implementing that and implementing it uh, effectively and getting the whole school on side. It's a school problem. It's not mm -hmm. the kid's problem who has ASD. And so it needs to be seen as a whole school community problem. Everybody has to get behind it. Mm -hmm. That takes effort. That takes work. That takes resources. There are a lot of schools who do a great job at this. There's some schools that don't, and we just have to bring everybody up to the same level. What's the secret in the schools where it does work? What are they doing that other schools are not doing? You've got a fabulous principal. Oh. It is a starts with the principal. Starts with the principal. The principal has to know about ASD, has to be committed to uh, diversity as being an asset to the school has to utilize that and has to call on the resources within the Board of Education and elsewhere to help deal with these kinds of issues. I also think that, I'm sorry, I also think that uh, in terms of schools wanting to um, build better defense against bullying, they should look at the autism families as a, as a reference. Autism families kind of refer to themselves as, as warriors because we build a fortress and we protect the people in our family that are vulnerable. And we look out for them at whatever cost. If you ask any autism parent, they will do anything for their child. Their mm -hmm. siblings will do anything for their brother. And they, are, they build a network, and they are always looking out for them, watching their back. And I think that's important for the schools to replicate. Mm -hmm. Catherine, I want to just follow up on one angle here. Namely, I think in Ontario about 25 years ago, they noticed that they needed better resources brought to bear to deal with heart surgery, and they did. And then they realized they needed more resources for hips and knees and eyes and so on, and they did. We now see that there are a, a lot more young people being diagnosed with autism, and I wonder if they've increased the resources to accommodate. No. Yes and no. Yes and no yes or no? Yes and no. What's the no? <laughs> I think that... Uh, we continue to work and advocate for the resources. I think much like Jennifer spoke of, it's a Swiss cheese system. I think that there are still gaps in the system, in the school system, around supporting children and youth. Because if I'd found out, I, I don't know, Dr. King, why don't you try this? If I would found, if I was a Minister of Health and I found out mm -hmm. autism rates had gone up 30% in the last five years, I might have a chat with my Deputy Minister about trying to marshal more resources to what was seemingly an exploding problem. I don't know, what do you think? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I had a con I was having a conversation with a large insurer yesterday. Um, they are seeing the writing on the wall in terms of legal decisions that are compelling insurance companies to cover more of the therapies that we know are helpful in autism. And their mindset was not, 
how can we ensure that we're able to um, you know, extend the accessibility of these therapies to everyone who needs it. Their mindset was very much around how can we contain mm -hmm. what it is that we're likely to be asked to do so that um, you know, it, it doesn't break the bank. Mm -hmm. But I, I think your point is so well taken. There, there seems to be a very different collective approach to addressing the increasing numbers of individuals that are being diagnosed. It's very different than um, what one would imagine would be the case if we were looking at an epidemic of cancer or heart mm -hmm. disease or what have you. Dr. Zatmary. I mean, I think uh, it's, it's worth putting this in a historical context. So when I started in the 80s, there was no dedicated funding for uh, autism or ASD in Ontario or in anywhere in Canada, zero. And over the years, the Ontario government has put a lot of money dedicated to autism programs like the ABA program, the Intensive Early Behavioral Intervention Program. So Ontario's put a lot of money into it. They've developed a system. You know what? It's not good enough. We have to do more. Mostly, we have to be smarter. We've got, a, we've got a lot of resources. We have to get them to work together more efficiently and to collaborate more efficiently. You said the Minister of Health. Actually, it's not the Minister of Health. It's the Minister of Child and Youth Services. Oh, okay. So getting the different ministries to work together and to get the agencies, the hospitals, the community agencies to work together in a comprehensive fashion, I think we can get a lot more bang for the buck than we currently are. Okay, new topic. I'm gonna to say two words that's guaranteed to drive most people who cover this stuff crazy. And that is Jenny McCarthy. You ready? You knew this was coming. Jenny McCarthy has been, of course, a, um, a persistent campaigner against vaccines because she says they can cause autism, despite the fact that there is I think no evidence at all for this position, or little evidence, or you fill in the blank, however you want to put it. Uh, she's come under fire numerous times for her views. Uh, quite a bit of blowback to those views. I'm going to show you a little snippet right now of a video that was a few years old. This is Penn and Teller replying to Jenny McCarthy in this YouTube video. Roll tape, please. We'll compare two groups of children. Teller's group gets no vaccinations. My group does. I'll use this plexiglass to represent the vaccinations. Oh, 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 that's bad. My vaccination wall knocked one of the children out of line. That's our one in 110 with autism. In the 1920s, before the diphtheria vaccination was common, there were 13 to 15,000 deaths a year from that disease. If you got it, your chances of dying were about 40%. In 1952, just before the salt vaccine became common, there were about 58,000 cases of polio. If you get unlucky, you might end up permanently disabled or dead. Meningitis, hepatitis A and B, flu, mumps, whooping cough, pneumonia, rotavirus, rubella, smallpox, tetanus, chickenpox, chickenpox. We have vaccinations against all of them. Which side do you want your child to stand on? So even if vaccination did cause autism, which it doesn't, anti-vaccination would still be bullshit. <laughs> Those guys are good. I got to hand it to them. Those guys are good. Never heard the other guy speak, but anyway. Uh, okay, Peter Zatmary, how much good or harm does this kind of attention do to the whole autism spectrum debate? does a lot of harm. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I put the Jenny McCarthy into celebrity, uh, celebrity science. Mm -hmm. Like, why do we go to celebrities to learn about science and health policy? It's, uh, it's just part of our celebrity cult. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. It's important to point out, Steve, that the, uh, not only is there no evidence that vaccines cause autism, the evidence that was published by Jenny McCarthy's colleague, Andrew Wakefield, was determined to be fraudulent. Yeah. And he lost his license as a result of that. And as a result, however, of the fact that this sort of myth is out there, people have, in particularly in British Columbia and Alberta, they've reduced the vaccination rate in the province. Folks aren't getting vaccinations. Kids are getting measles as a result, and kids are dying as a result. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this harm, what is considered to be a harmless statement, 
by somebody, by a celebrity who's making these kinds of statements, has enormous potential for harm. And, uh, you know, we really have to, as a society, take a stand against making health policies based on, uh, you know, fancies, dreams, whatever. Dr. King? So, so actually, in partial answer to your question, we've talked about the age of um, diagnosis uh, in children, young people with autism, and in many, in many situations, the time when people are uh, just about becoming concerned and, and perhaps even seeing the, the first uh, glimpses of a departure from typical development are right around the same times that um, they, they align with the immunization schedule to some degree. And so, so it, it's not um, unthinkable that people would create an association in their minds with, gee, you know, we were just in for our vaccinations two weeks ago, and now all of a sudden I'm seeing all these things that are, uh, that are very different and, and scary. But coming back, you asked about what we had learned about autism uh, in the last um, you know, 25 years or so. And one of the things that, that is very exciting in terms of getting us closer to understanding uh, what causes it is, is the advance that's taken place in neuroscience that uh, increasingly is moving the onset of whatever um, it is that ultimately leads to autism uh, more clearly into the uh, prenatal period. And so, so I think as time goes on and we're better able to nail that down, it will become ever clearer that um, exposure to vaccinations or whatever uh, is, is completely disconnected from the foundations that ultimately lead to uh, an autism spectrum disorder. Okay, let's, uh, I think we've got about 10 minutes and change here and I want to shift our conversation from uh, autism spectrum disorder, which you all recognize in very young children, too. What do you do about it if you're 20 or 25? And is that a different kind of a challenge? Uh, Peter, why don't you pick up on that? As a, if you're not a young kid, if you're a 20-year-old trying to de deal with something on the autism spectrum, how is that different from two, three, four, five, six-year-old child dealing with it? It's like being pushed off a cliff mm -hmm. because the Again, it's a new ministry that takes over once they transition out of school and the services post uh, school transition are very, very low relative to the services that are available whilst you're in school. And again, I think there's just so many opportunities to do things, but we just haven't got things organized in the developmental disability system for young adults and we have to really pay attention to their mental health as well because mm -hmm. not only do they have a developmental disability there's also a much higher risk of developing mental health problems mm -hmm. like anxiety and depression and we're not the the health services aren't really facing that particular challenge mm -hmm. of dealing with mental health issues in those with developmental disabilities like autism. Jennifer, is this ring true with you? Absolutely. So another person near and dear to my heart who is an adult with Asperger's syndrome um, has sort of faced challenges and is now involved in the mental health system. And in that mental health system, what happens is he can receive treatment for the social anxiety and the and the depression. Um, but when they sort of stabilize him, they want to kick him back to the community again for assistance from centers like the Red Pass centers. Well, that, first of all, has a waiting list that's out of this world. And second of all, costs between one and $300 an hour that's not affordable assistance, right? So this, this person floats there. For me, uh, regarding my son, um, it's a real, real fear. The, the thing that comforts me is that he, my son has had more interventions than the people that have gone before him. So perhaps we've been able to, you know, uh, increase his level of self-esteem and his self-worth about other things other than necessarily employment, although he is very interested in employment, he's very interested in being independent, he's very interested in being a father. <laughs> um, in fact, he doesn't even believe that he's disadvantaged by having Asperger's syndrome at all. He believes we're disadvantaged as neurological typicals. So, you Explain know, that. That's interesting. What? Be, because he sees himself as having, 
he knows he has Asperger's syndrome. He knows he has autism. He he's aware of his diagnosis, but he thinks he has skills that we don't have. Which he probably does. Absolutely, yeah. he's extremely intelligent human being. Extremely intelligent human being. He has um, an amazing memory for facts and information that he's particularly interested in. Can become a very deep subject matter expert in these things, and sort of thinks our way of being uh, less than direct with each other, shall we say, is you know dishonest and inappropriate, and you know lying. He, he doesn't happen. bevel his edges, does he? No. He's right out there. <laughs> He's yeah. right in your face. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And that's a degree of honesty that the rest of us probably yes. don't have because we are Absolutely. taking other people's feelings into account when we say things and yes or stuff we're like being that. political or manipulative right. in right. some other right. way right that was yeah. probably a better way to put it yeah. how about in the case of your brother how well, old, he's how old now he's 25 25 now steve okay. there's not enough services no. they're not accessible they're not affordable yeah. and it's at the point where i mean there's so much research we know the conditions we know the challenges mm -hmm. that they're facing as young adults it's time to take concrete action. Mm -hmm. And I, my brother can't wait, he can't wait. Mm -hmm. Like what is he gonna do, wait another five years, wait another six years for these supports? Mm -hmm. So while he doesn't have the ability to start a business, I do. Mm -hmm. I have all the help that I can ask for in starting my business, but everybody needs help mm -hmm. in certain areas. And he needs the help that he needs to be able to achieve his dreams. Mm -hmm. I look Absolutely. at him, Steve, and I know that he's yearning for more. He graduated from high school. He doesn't want to be at home all the time. Mm -hmm. He wants to get out. He wants to pursue education. He wants to pursue skill development. And he wants to pursue a future of his mm -hmm. own. He wants his mm -hmm. own legacy, and he deserves it. Mm -hmm. It's actually a human rights issue when you think about it. What I prevents agree. him from doing that right now? He needs that extra little bit of support. Mm -hmm. He has no sense of danger. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes to the door and knocks on the door, he'll open it regardless of who it is. Mm -hmm. Somebody pulls up to him on the street in a car and says, get in, he's going to get in that mm -hmm. car. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create a buffer, something to help him in those situations because we're not always going to be there. The family's not always going to be there. And the goal is so that they can live independently and safely mm -hmm. in society. Mm -hmm. So he needs a buddy. He needs somebody to kind of Hang um, with him and watch out friend, for him. I would, do you remember yeah. your first day of high school? No. Okay. <laughs> or college or, but I no, mean, you were, all, years ago. No. you were all alone. Yeah. And the feeling when you find your first friend mm -hmm. is, it's incomparable. Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're not alone in the world. Mm -hmm. You're not alone in a new situation, a new environment. Mm -hmm. And you have that person to ask for help and to mm -hmm. fall back on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 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 coming back to a reference I made before, Peter, you know, uh, We've decided home care is very important, yep. and more resources are being poured into home yep. care, so yep. seniors can live in their homes, yep. uh, God willing, until they die. Yep. Mm -hmm. Same thing. You need assisted housing, you need supported housing, you need recreation opportunities, mm -hmm. you need skill development, you need job coaches. Mm -hmm. There's good evidence that having a job coach to sort of take uh, you know, somebody like, uh, like that into the into a working environment, the library, the grocery store, work with them, teach them the skills. If you can teach them the skills and you repeat it, it sticks and they are the best workers uh, ever. They're, they can be absolutely amazing because they tend to be so rigid once they've learned it. But those supports, that housing, that recreation, uh, that job coach, that skill development, that's really uh, really not available. And then we've got to add the health component as well, the physical health, because you know we don't really know what are some of the physical health issues as they go get older. Mm -hmm. uh, when does dementia come? Does dementia mm -hmm. come earlier? Are they protected from it? Maybe we don't know. You don't know that. Yet. We don't know that because they mm -hmm. haven't they haven't grown up to be that old. Remember, we just mm -hmm. discovered autism in the in 1940, and then it's sort of. Um, expanded so and their mental health issues as well so you really have to take a very holistic approach mm -hmm. uh, and not just compartmentalize it and isolate it and those resources really aren't available they are in Europe hmm. uh, but uh, in North America and in Canada they're not really there do you Catherine your group do you lobby government absolutely and okay I was just there's no one system that focuses specifically on adults with autism mm -hmm. Yona Lensky just recently completed the Atlas of primary care which is the largest study of its kind that looks at the medical supports for people with dual um, for people with um, uh, developmental disabilities um, and it, it takes a look at the realities, the harsh realities. You were talking about your brother not liking white rice. Most doctors don't understand the gastrointestinal sensitivities right. a person mm -hmm. with autism can face. Mm -hmm. um, that you know they have food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. King, come on in here and tell us. You've heard some of the Ontario experience. Uh, how is it in Washington mm -hmm. State? How is it in the United States right now? Any different? Um, sadly, no. In fact, I think in many ways it sounds worse. Um, we, we share the same black hole uh, that uh, Peter talked about. But I will say that there, um, there are glimmers of hope that are um, appearing. And hearkening back to what Peter said about the advantages of an inclusive educational environment, environment for young people with autism as they're going through school, um, there are many employers or an increasing number of employers who are also recognizing um, how great it is for the work environment environment to have someone who loves to go to work every day who cannot think of a different a, another place that he would rather be every day it's infectious and um, increasingly you know we we are I think um, going to be in a place where where we recognize that uh, it's a much um, more beautiful picture that we end up with when we paint on the entire canvas when we include people with autism in the fabric of, uh, of our society more fully. We all stand to benefit. Hmm. Jennifer, here's the reality. The reality is we already spend in this, in this province $50 billion a year on health care. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants their piece of that pie, Absolutely. right? The hospitals mm -hmm. want their piece, and the doctors want their piece, and mm -hmm. the you know, cancer care wants its piece, and, and on and on we go. How would you, I mean, I know we're here on Autism Awareness Day, but how, how do you make the pitch that your particular slice of that pie needs to get bigger mm -hmm. to deal with the burgeoning mm -hmm. crisis this is? Well, I really believe that um, on most of the spectrum that these people can be extremely um, contributing significantly to our society, that they can make a huge difference to employers, to themselves, if we are able to invest in them early. So I believe that we need to invest in them now, not only when they're young, but when they're young adults, to give them those skills. Because remembering this is a developmental delay, so they are sort of younger uh, than their chronological age. So I think we need to invest in them now, because I think we'll pay for it one way or another. If we do not give these guys the skills to get out in the world, uh, to cope with jobs, to cope with danger, uh, then we are going to pay for it in another way. We're going, so. to, we're going to have to support them on welfare. We're going to have to, you know, face these other issues that are going to come up. They're going to be a burden, not a burden, but they're going to be a, ta a, a tax on on society one way or another, right? So if we give them this front end, if we front end load them with these skills, they're going to be amazing members of society. Your son is in grade 12 now? Grade 12. So he's got a decision to make. Well, he's going to do 12.5, and then we have a decision to make. But he I will see. go to college or university. He will go. Absolutely. Your choice or his? His. His choice. <laughs> he wants to go. Yeah. Yeah, there's a little bit of me in that. <laughs> yeah. And your brother? My brother is at home. My brother wants these opportunities, but there are opportunities for him. Or if they exist, they're a little bit just beyond his reach. And he needs that extra support to get there. There's so many people that I've worked with who are in the same position. And yet these supports don't exist. Or they're too expensive. Mm -hmm. Who can pay $300 a, like, or mm -hmm. $300 an hour? Absolutely. Not me, mm -hmm. <laughs> not my family. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the reality, reality is that most autism families can't afford it either. Mm -hmm. Because one parent is usually at home mm -hmm. while the other one is working. Right you know, nonstop. So yeah. we have to have accessible, affordable supports to mm -hmm. get them to where they need to be in this life. Mm -hmm. I want to thank all of you for coming in tonight and helping us better understand these issues on this Autism Awareness Day. Brian King, the director of Seattle Children's Autism Center, thank you for being on the line from Seattle, Washington for us. Uh, Catherine Buchan from Autism Ontario. Nadia Hamilton, Magnus Mode, check thank it you. out. Uh, Dr. Peter Zatmary from the uh, Child and Youth Mental Health Collaborative and Jennifer Kustra. We wish you all well and thank you for sharing your stories with us tonight. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.